Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson Part 1. I Am Born February 12, 1963 I am born on a Tuesday at University Hospital, Columbus, Ohio, USA, a country caught between black and white. I am born not long from the time or far from the place where my great-great-grandparents worked the deep, rich land, unfree, dawn until dusk, unpaid, drank cool water from scooped-out gourds, looked up and followed the sky's mirrored constellation to freedom. I am born as the South explodes, too many people, too many years, enslaved, then emancipated, but not free. The people who look like me keep fighting and marching and getting killed. So that day, February 12th, 1963, and every day from this moment on, brown children like me can grow up free, can grow up learning and voting and walking and riding wherever we want. I am born in Ohio, but the stories of South Carolina already run like rivers through my veins. Second Daughter's Second Day on Earth My birth certificate says, Female Negro, Mother, Mary Ann Irby, 22, Negro, Father, Jack Austin Woodson, 25, Negro. In Birmingham, Alabama, Martin Luther King Jr. is planning a march on Washington, where John F. Kennedy is president. In Harlem, Malcolm X is standing on a soapbox, talking about a revolution. Outside the window of University Hospital, snow is slowly falling. So much already covers this vast Ohio ground. In Montgomery, only seven years have passed since Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a city bus. I am born brown-skinned, black-haired, and wide-eyed. I am born Negro here and colored there and somewhere else. The freedom singers have linked their arms, their protests rising into song. Deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome some day. And somewhere else, James Baldwin is writing about injustice, each novel, each essay, changing the world. I do not yet know who I'll be, what I'll say, how I'll say it. Not even three years have passed since a brown girl named Ruby Bridges walked into an all-white school. Armed guards surrounded her while hundreds of white people spat and called her names. She was six years old. I do not know if I'll be strong like Ruby. I do not know what the world will look like when I am finally able to walk, speak, write. Another Buckeye, the nurse says to my mother, already I am being named for this place. Ohio, the Buckeye State. My fingers curl into fists automatically. This is the way, my mother said, of every baby's hand. I do not know if these hands will become Malcolm's, raised and fisted, or Martin's, open and asking, or James, curled around a pen. I do not know if these hands will be roses or rubies, gently gloved and fiercely folded, calmly in a lap on a desk, around a book, ready to change the world. A girl named Jack. Good enough name for me, my father said, the day I was born. Don't see why she can't have it too. But the women said no, my mother first, then each aunt, pulling my pink blanket back, patting the crop of thick curls, tugging at my new toes, touching my cheeks. 
We won't have a girl named Jack, my mother said, and my father's sister whispered, A boy named Jack is bad enough, but only so my mother could hear. Name a girl Jack, my father said, and she can't help but grow up strong. Raise her right, my father said, and she'll make the name her own. Name a girl Jack, and people will look at her twice, my father said. For no good reason but to ask if her parents were crazy, my mother said. And back and forth it went until I was Jackie, and my father left the hospital mad. My mother said to my aunts, hand me that pen, wrote Jacqueline, where it asked for my name. Jacqueline, just in case someone thought to drop the I-E. Jacqueline, just in case I grew up and wanted something a bit longer and farther away from Jack. The Woodsons of Ohio My father's family can trace their history back to Thomas Woodson of Chillicote, said to be the first son of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Some say this isn't so, but the Woodsons of Ohio know what the Woodsons coming before them left behind, and Bibles and stories and history coming down through time. So, ask any Woodson why you can't go down the Woodson line without finding doctors and lawyers and teachers, athletes and scholars and people in the government. They'll say, we had a head start. They'll say, Thomas Woodson expected the best of us. They'll lean back, lace their fingers across their chests, smile a smile that's older than time, say, Well, it all started back before Thomas Jefferson Woodson of Chillicote. And they'll begin to tell our long, long story. The Ghosts of the Nelsonville House the Woodsons are one of the few black families in this town. Their house is big and white and sits on a hill. Look up to see them through the high windows inside a kitchen filled with the light of a watery Nelsonville sun. In the parlor, a fireplace burns warmth into the long Ohio winter. Keep looking and it's spring again. The light's gold now and dancing across the pine floors. Once, there were so many children here, running through this house, up and down the stairs, hiding under beds and in trunks, sneaking into the kitchen for tiny pieces of icebox cake, cold fried chicken, thick slices of their mother's honey ham. Once, my father was a baby here, and then he was a boy, but that was a long time ago. In the photos, my grandfather is taller than everybody and my grandmother just an inch shorter. On the walls, their children run through fields, play in pools, dance in teen-filled rooms, all of them. Grown up and gone now, but wait, look closely. There's Aunt Alicia, the baby girl, curls spiraling over her shoulders, her hands cupped around a bouquet of flowers, only four years old in that picture, and already a reader. Beside Alicia, another picture, my father Jack, the oldest boy, eight years old and mad about something, or is it someone we cannot see? In another picture, my uncle Woody, baby boy, laughing and pointing, the Nelsonville house behind him and maybe his brother at the end of his pointed finger. My aunt Anne, in her nurse's uniform, my Aunt Ada in her university sweater, buckeye to the bone. The children of hope and grace look closely. There I am, in the furrow of Jack's brow, in the slyness of Alicia's smile, in the bend of Grace's hand. There I am, beginning. It'll be scary sometimes. My great-great-grandfather on my father's side was born free in Ohio, 1832, built his home and farmed his land, then dug for coal when the farming wasn't enough. 
fought hard in the war, his name in stone now on the Civil War Memorial. William J. Woodson, United States Colored Troops, Union, Company B, a long time dead but living still among the other soldiers on the monument in Washington, D.C. His son was sent to Nelsonville, lived with an aunt. William Woodson, the only brown boy in an all-white school. You'll face this in your life someday, my mother will tell us, over and over again. A moment when you walk into a room and no one there is like you. It'll be scary sometimes, but think of William Woodson and you'll be all right. Football Dreams No one was faster than my father on the football field. No one could keep him from crossing the line, then touching down again. Coaches were watching the way he moved, his easy stride, his long arms reaching up, snatching the ball from its soft pocket of air. My father dreamed football dreams and woke to a scholarship in Ohio State University. Grown now, living the big city life in Columbus, just 60 miles from Nelsonville. And from there, Interstate 70 would get you on your way west to Chicago. Interstate 77 could take you south. But my father said, no colored Buckeye in his right mind would ever want to go there. From Columbus, my father said, you could go just about anywhere. Other People's Memory You were born in the morning, Grandma Georgiana said. I remember the sound of the birds. Mean old blue jays squawking. They like to fight, you know. Don't mess with the blue jays. I hear they can kill a cat if they get mad enough. And then the phone was ringing. Through all of that static and squawking, I heard your mama telling me you'd come. Another girl, I stood there thinking, so close to the first one, just like your mama and Caroline. Not even a year between them, and so close, you could hardly tell where one ended and the other started. And that's how I know you came in the morning. That's how I remember. You came in the late afternoon, my mother said, two days after I turned 22. Your father was at work, took a rush hour bus, trying to get to you, but by the time he arrived, you were already here. He missed the moment, my mother said, but what else is new? You're the one that was born near night, my father said. When I saw you, I said, she's the unlucky one, came out looking just like her daddy. He laughs. Right off the bat, I told your mama, we're going to call this one after me. My time of birth wasn't listed, listed on the certificate, then got lost again amid other people's bad memory. No returns. When my mother comes home from the hospital with me, my older brother takes one look inside the pink blanket, says, Take her back. We already have one of those. Already three years old and still doesn't understand how something so tiny and new can't be returned. How to listen. Number one. Somewhere in my brain, each laugh, tear, and lullaby becomes memory. Uncle Odell. Six months before my big sister was born, my Uncle Odell was hit by a car. While home in South Carolina, on leave from the Navy. When the phone rang in the Nelsonville house, maybe my mother was out hanging laundry on the line or down in the kitchen, speaking softly with her mother-in-law, Grace, missing her own mama back home. Maybe the car was packed and ready for the drive back to Columbus the place my father called the big city, now their home. But every Saturday morning, they drove the hour to Nelsonville and stayed till Sunday night. Maybe right before the phone rang, tomorrow was just another day 
but when the news of my uncle's dying traveled from the place he fell in South Carolina to the cold March morning in Ohio, my mother looked out into the a gray day that would change her forever. Your brother. My mother heard her own mother say, and then there was only a roaring in the air around her, a new pain where once there wasn't pain, a hollowness where only minutes before she had been whole. Good News Months before the bone-cold Buckeye winter settles over Ohio, the last September light brings my older sister, named Odella Caroline, after my uncle Odell and my aunt Caroline. In South Carolina, the phone rings and my mother's mother moves towards it. She closes her eyes, then opens them to look out over her yard. As she reaches for it, she watches the light slip through the heavy pine needles, dapples everything with sweet September light. Her hand on the phone now, she lifts it, praying silently for the good news. The sweet chill of autumn is finally bringing her way. My Mother and Grace It is the South that brings my mother and my father's mother, Grace, together. Grace's family is from Greenville, too, so my mother is home to her in a way her own kids can't understand. You know how those Woodsons are, Grace says, the Woodsons this and the North that, making Mama smile. Remember that Grace, too, was someone else before. Remember that Grace, like my mother, wasn't always a Woodson. They are home to each other. Grace to my mother is as familiar as the Greenville air. Both know that southern way of thinking, without words, remember when the heat of summer could melt the mouth, so southerners stayed quiet, looked out over the land, nodded at what seemed like nothing, but that silent nod said everything anyone needed to hear. Here in Ohio, my mother and Grace aren't afraid of too much air between words are happy just for another familiar body in the room. But the few words in my mother's mouth became the missing. After Odell dies, a different silence than either of them has ever known. I'm sorry about your brother, Grace says. Guess God needed him back and sent you a baby girl. But both of them know the hole that is missing isn't filled now. Um, my mother says, Bless the dead and the living, Grace says. Then more silence, both of them knowing there's nothing left to say. Each winter, each winter, just as the first of the snow begins to fall, my mother goes home to South Carolina. Sometimes my father goes with her, but mostly he doesn't. So as she gets on the bus alone, the first year with one, the second year with two, and finally with three children, Hope and Dell hugging each leg, and me in her arms, always there is a fight before she leaves. Ohio is where my father wants to be, but to my mother, Ohio will never be home. No matter how many plants she brings indoors each winter, singing softly to them, the lilt of her words a breath of warm air moving over each leaf. In return, they hold on to their color even as the snow begins to fall, a reminder of the deep green south, a promise of life somewhere. Journey You can keep your south, my father says. The way they treat us down there, I got your mama out as quick as I could, brought her right up here to Ohio, told her there's never gonna be a Woodson that sits in the back of the bus, never gonna be a Woodson that has to yes sir and no sir white people, never gonna be a Woodson made to look down at the ground. All you kids are stronger than that, my father says, 
all you Woodson kids deserve to be as good as you already are. Yes, sirree, Bob, my father says. You can keep your South Carolina. Greenville, South Carolina, 1963. On the bus, my mother moves with us to the back. It is 1963 in South Carolina. Too dangerous to sit closer to the front and dare the driver to make her move. Not with us, not now. Me in her arms, all of three months old. My sister and brother squeezed into the seat be beside her. White shirt, tie, and my brother's head shaved clean. My sister's braids, white ribboned. Sit up straight, my mother says. She tells my brother to take his fingers out of his mouth. They do what is asked of them, although they don't know why they have to. This isn't Ohio, my mother says, as though we understand. Her mouth a small lipsticked dash, her back sharp as a line. Do not cross, colored to the back. Step off the curb if a white person comes toward you. Don't look them in the eye. Yes, sir. No, sir. My apologies. Her eyes straight ahead. My mother is miles away from here. Then her mouth softens. Her hand moves gently over my brother's warm head. He is three years old, his wide eyes open to the world, his two big ears already listening. We're as good as anybody, my mother whispers. As good as anybody. Home. Soon. We are near my other grandparents' house. Small red stone, immense yard surrounding it. Hall Street. A front porch swing, thirsty for oil. A pot of azaleas blooming. A pine tree. Red dirt wafting up around my mother's newly polished shoes. Welcome home, my grandparents say, their warm brown arms around us. A white handkerchief embroidered with blue to wipe away my mother's tears and me, the new baby, set deep inside this love. The Cousins It's my mother's birthday and the music is turned up loud. Her cousins all around her, the way it was before she left. The same cousins she played with as a girl. Remember the time, they ask? When we stole Miss Carter's peach pie off her windowsill, got stuck in that ditch down below Todd's house, climbed that fence and snuck into Greenville Pool, weren't scared about getting arrested either, shoot. Nobody telling us where we can and can't swim. And she laughs, remembering it all. On the radio, Sam Cooke is singing, twisting the night away. Let me tell you about a place somewhere up a New York way. The cousins have come from a far away as Spartanburg, the boys dressed in skinny-legged pants, the girls in flowy skirts that swirl out when they spin, twisting the night away, cousin Dorothy's fiancé holding tight to her hand as they twist, cousin Sam dancing with Mama, ready to catch her if she falls, he says, and my mother remembering being a little girl looking down, scared from a high-up tree, and seeing her cousin there, waiting. Here they have a lot of fun, putting trouble on the run, twisting the night away. I know you weren't staying up north, the cousin says. You belong here with us. My mother throws her head back, her newly pressed and curled hair gleaming, her smile the same one she had before she left Columbus. She's Mary Ann Irby again. Georgina and Gunner's youngest daughter. She's home. Night Bus My father arrives on a night bus, his hat in his hands. It is May now, and the rain is coming down. Later, with the end of this rain, will come the sweet smell of the honeysuckle. But for now, there is only the sky opening, and my father's tears. I'm sorry. He whispers. This fight is over for now. Tomorrow we will travel as a family back to Columbus, Ohio, Hope and Dell fighting for a place in my father's lap. 
Greenville, with its separate ways growing small behind us. For now, my parents stand hugging in the warm Carolina rain. No past, no future, just this perfect now. After Greenville, number one. After the chicken is fried and wrapped in wax paper, tucked gently into cardboard shoe boxes and tied with string. After the cornbread is cut into wedges, the peaches washed and dried, and the sweet tea is poured into the mason jars, twisted tight, and the deviled eggs are scooped back inside their egg white beds, slipped into porcelain bowls that are my mother's now, a gift her mother sends with her on the journey. After the clothes are folded back into suitcases, the hair ribbons and shirts washed and ironed, after my mother's lipstick is on and my father's scratchy beginnings of a beard are gone, after our faces are coated with a thin layer of Vaseline gently wiped off again with a cool wet cloth, then it is time to say our goodbyes. The small clutch of us children pressed against my grandmother's apron, her tears quickly blinked away. After the night falls and it is safe for brown people to leave the South without getting stopped and sometimes beaten and always questioned, are you one of those freedom riders? Are you one of those civil rights people? What gives you the right? We boarded the Greyhound bus bound for Ohio. Rivers The Hawking River moves like a flowing arm away from the Ohio River, runs through towns as though it's chasing its own freedom, the same way the Ohio runs north from Virginia until it's safely away from the south. Each town the Hawking touches tells a story. Athens, Coolville, Lancaster, Nelsonville. Each waits for the Hawking water to wash through. Then, as though the river remembers where it belongs and what it belongs to, it circles back, joins up with the Ohio again, as if to say, I'm sorry, as if to say, I went away from here, but now... I'm home again. Leaving Columbus When my parents fight for the final time, my older brother is four, my sister is nearly three, and I have just celebrated my first birthday without celebration. There is only one photograph of them from their time together, a wedding picture torn from the local paper him in a suit and tie, her in a bride gown, beautiful although neither one is smiling. Only one photograph. Maybe the memory of Columbus was too much for my mother to save anymore. Maybe the memory of my mother was a painful stone inside my father's heart. But what did it look like when she finally left him? A woman, nearly six feet tall, straight-backed and proud, heading down a cold Columbus street, two small children beside her and a still-crawling baby in her arms. My father, whose reddish-brown skin would later remind me of the red dirt in the south and all that was rich about it, standing in the yard, one hand on the black metal railing and the other lifting into a weak wave goodbye, as though we were simply guests leaving Sunday supper.